is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Sig Sauer. My guest today is a very special friend of mine, Jim Shockey. You probably know him from Jim Shockey's Hunting Adventures, The Professionals, and Uncharted. So he's been a uh, icon of the outdoor industry, of the hunting industry, for uh, for a few years now. And it was such a pleasure to get to talk to him. Uh, I also got to talk to him about this. Now, this is a novel. And uh, as you're hearing the conversation, it's something pretty special. And it's called uh, Man of Sores. The Soul Catcher, and it's uh, actually I don't really know how to how best to describe this, but listen to the podcast, check it out. Uh, Jim sent this to me a few months back, and I wanted to make sure that I read it at a time when I could turn everything off, take a breath, spend some time with it, and I'm so glad that I did because there's uh, I'm holding something special in my hands right here. So uh, we talk about this on the podcast. We talk about the state of the world. We talk about politics. Uh, we get into it. And uh, you might also might know Eva Shockey, Jim's daughter, who has been fantastic to me as I entered this this world of publishing and uh, uh, this world of really social media and outreach and engagement and all, and all of that. So uh, you can find her online quite a few places. And Jim is at, if you go to jimshockey.com, you can see everything that he has going on there. Uh, he is official Jim Shockey on Instagram. Instagram, and he is Jim Shockey on Twitter and Facebook. So you can follow along with everything he has going on on those platforms. So uh, if you like what you hear, make sure you leave a review wherever you get your podcast. Leave a five-star review to help beat those uh, so social media, big tech algorithms, and uh, we'll keep doing these. So without further ado, my friend, Jim Shockey. And I don't know how, I'm not going to show the cover, <laughs> I'm not going to show the cover of this, but wow, this is incredible. I read it. And this is the only book I've read probably in the last year because I'm doing so much research. I'm reading so many books for blurbs or interviews that I, and like I told you when you sent this months ago that I wanted to savor it. I wanted to sit down and read every word, have it be nice and quiet. And there are, this is the only book that I've done that with in the last couple of years. This wow. is incredible. And I don't want to say the name or anything. I don't know how comfortable you are talking about it, but I know you mentioned it at least once uh, publicly yeah. that you were working on something. You, you can mention the name. You can say it. You, for, for those of you who don't know, so this is a, a book. Jim Shockey wrote this book. It's called Man of Soul of Sores, The Soul Catcher. And uh, this, I don't even know what category to put this in. It doesn't fit in a category. That's the other, other side of it. So besides all the political stuff going on out there, um, in my limited experience in publishing, when you don't fit into a certain category, uh, it's, it, it breaks that norm and it's a little tougher to find that traction. Um, and of course, once you do those books that are outside the norm, then they take off when you, when you have something like a, uh, uh, uh like a Harry Potter, or you have something like a game of Thrones, or you have something like that, that kind of fit a category, but, uh, not really this, this, you can't call this a political thriller. It's not a you know, I don't know where, where it falls, um, which made it so captivating to read. And I tell you what, I love books that are nonlinear in nature. I have one, I have one outlined that's, uh, that I'll, I'm going to work on at some point that's, uh, that's nonlinear and, and jumps around a bit. There's a book called the sun by Philip Meyer, which is essentially the history of Texas through the eyes of a, of a family from the 1800s up to present day. Uh, and he did an amazing job with it. Uh, but this is a di different, the way you did this and the way you used a manuscript to tell a story was fascinating. I absolutely love this. I could not be more thrilled for this book right here. I mean, I, and I, and I don't say that lightly. You no, know, if I kind of liked it, I'd be like, Oh, it was amazing. This thing is different. And, uh, I, I had tons of respect for you obviously before, but this puts you on like a, uh, like this is no small undertaking what you did here. And it is, it obviously shows just the depth of respect that you have for the, uh, the artwork that you describe in here, the cultures that you describe in here. It's not like you just decided to make this up one day and start studying. Like this is a lifetime of research and passion in these pages telling this story. It's amazing. I, I think, you know, I, I, I wrote when I sent it into you know, my agent and I said, if you're going to take it to the publisher, just, just, and I, and I think I may have said this about your book, actually, uh, when, you know, you, you can, Right, become a writer and then live life after, or you can live life and then become a writer. 
you know, so, so I've, I, this, this novel is actually the reason it's so difficult to classify it. It's kind of, because it's kind of track thriller, but, but honestly, go Google every single fact in that book. And it's, you'll find that it's more of a biography, autobiography uh, than anything. And that, that's, you know, things you, you can't, well, you know, the deal, you can't say, but you know, there you go. You can read it. And that's why it doesn't, it doesn't compute for, for most of the people that read it. Although, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled over the moon, happy that you, uh, you enjoyed oh, it. I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about it. I'm trying to put together a plan, like who to get this to and, and all the rest of it. But, um, but I was, I started Googling things too. Cause at first, you know, I, you know, I knew your background, of course. So if someone comes to this without knowing your background, without knowing you have a museum up there, which I want to talk to you about, uh, but uh, just comes to this, they might not Google everything right away until they're about halfway through. And then they're like, wait a sec, I recognize a name here. Or I've heard of that artist here or something, something clicks. And then they start looking up all these other facets, which it was incredible. And especially, of course, being a child of the 80s, you wove in some some movie magic, some other authors in there that, uh, that are part of the story. And I love those touch points, those because uh, uh, people connect with them. And there are so many of them in here that, that every reader is going to connect with at least one of these one of these things, even if they're not a student of art history or these cultures that you describe uh, essentially from the beginning of time to today, uh, if they don't have a touch point with those, there's a couple more modern references in there that will definitely key off in their head. So uh, I think those touch points are important when you're writing because it connects people to that story in a more personal way. And you did it in a way that I've never seen done before. Oh, that's awesome. I, 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 you know, you, who's as well read as you are, that you have no idea. I'm, I'm ready to turn this off and go jump up and down <laughs> and, and come back to the screen and say, yes, yes. What were we talking about? <laughs> well, I'm so excited about it because I remember when you said it to me, I was like, I want to spend time with it. And uh, I find today that with everything going on with books and the filming of the Amazon series and everything, that when I have something that's really special, I want to get to, and I put it aside, uh, then I keep putting it off because there's never, I, I can't make time because there's so many other things getting pulled in a million different directions. And so when you said yes to jumping on the podcast, I was like, okay, this is my excuse to sit down, turn everything off. I don't have, you know, things beeping at me all the time when I'm reading. I like to sit down and just just be totally absorbed in the story. And that's what I did with this this week. And awesome. uh, I, it, was, it was a fantastic week. It was the first week I had to take a breath in what seems like years. Yeah. So it was really special that I got to spend it with this and that you trusted me with this. And it's uh, it's incredible. So yeah, thank you for writing it. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't, how, when did you start writing this? Did you start it a long time ago and work on it along the yeah. way? Or? You know, I, I, and I, I was going to ask you that. I mean, I, I would spend the whole podcast. Your, unfortunately, it's your podcast, but if it was mine, I'd be, <laughs> I want to pick your brains to figure out how you think things through. But I, um, I wrote the first, the first page uh, over 25 years ago. Um, you know, Javago's dead. I killed him. That was. I mean, I had that entire book because I was living it. So I know that seems weird, but but that's what was that's what I was doing. So, so the um, I wrote the first the hundred first hundred pages. Literally, I could have written that with my eyes closed watching television and just writing because I knew every virtually every sentence, every paragraph for the first hundred pages. And then, then, you know, then I didn't have it quite as, as sorted out in my brain again, because I just hadn't spent the time over the last 20 years organizing it, but, but it was, it was all written already. In fact, the second and third are, you know, there because I've lived it. So it's really simple that when you, well, who, who's it? Uh, the best writing is is truthful writing. When you're telling the truth, it's pretty simple to write. You don't have to you don't have to embellish it all. But like yeah. you say, it doesn't quite. It's cognitive dissonance when you read it because it's well that can't be real, can it? You know, but it's it's uh, there's a serious amount of fact in that. Uh, oh yeah. That was incredible. I started checking uh, as, as I went because I was like, wait a second. You know, that might, I think this is so much knowledge woven in here in a way that seems so effortless, which is how the best do it. They make it seem, you know, effortless. Um, but there was so much in there woven in so perfectly uh, that it, I mean, I was, yeah, very rarely am I engrossed in a book where I just can't, I, I mean, I stayed up late last night because I knew we had this today. So I stayed up super late last night. Rarely do I do that anymore um, unless I'm working, you know, typing away on my own stuff because it's finally quiet in this house. Uh, so don't tell my editor that, uh, that I wasn't working on book five. I was reading your yeah. book, uh, yeah. but I wanted to make sure that I got, uh, that I read it in time to, to talk when, to you today. When, Incredible. When did, you, when did you figure out uh, like the, the crescendo? 
Uh, I was, sus- I suspected, you know, cause I'm in this, you know, I was kind of searching for it. Yeah, so I was, I was, watching, yeah, watching, yeah, I, the clues are all through it. The yeah. clues are right from the first page. Yeah. I, so I didn't figure it out on you know, the first page, but, uh, but I figured it out fairly early on just because I was looking and because I know you and because I've been waiting for this for so long. So I wasn't just going to this with a, oh, I've got to read this to blurb it for somebody, or, Hey, I've got to read this cause I have an interview coming up or, you know, that, or, Hey, I got to go to a certain chapter and find a certain sentence in order to take that out and put it in my novel or to fact check something for one of my novels. Uh, so it wasn't like that at all. It was, I'm going in and I'm excited to go in cause I've been waiting for, so it's been sitting there for what, like four months now, I think. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, so I was so excited to, to jump in. So I was like a detective going through this thing. And I was initial, I was just so captured by that nonlinear approach, which I love. And I didn't know that was coming. Uh, when you first sent it to me, I read that first page, you know, that initial italicized, uh, first page. Yeah. And I texted you and was like, Hey, this is amazing. I love it, but I'm going to hold on to it until I can sit down and not be distracted and not be pulled in a thousand different directions. Um, um, so that first, that those, those first words are important in any novel. Uh, and you nailed it in this one and, and never let up the whole way through. Like there was never one single point, which is very rare that I ever was like, eh, I'm just going to skip ahead here. I'm going to go through this a little faster. Eh. Every single page I was like, so, and I was so happy also. So I was having this joy reading it because we know each other and we're friends. And I'm like, I was so happy that I was loving it. And I was having this experience reading something that you put so much heart into. And that's the thing that separates novels, you know, just normal novels from other others is that, is that thing heart, it's that intangible and you can't, yeah. you can't put pinpoint it, but it's, it's, it's like anything else in life and with art or anything, it's that, that heart. Um, and then this certainly has it. So, so well done. And I'm excited to, we'll talk offline about, uh, next steps with it because it's special. Uh, so, so I'm on your podcast and we're talking about my novel, not your novels. <laughs> your, yours are like, rocket ships i mean i see the billboards and the number one new york bestseller i mean holy cow well when i read the the first one uh obviously i knew the talent was there but uh to see what you've done since then wow i mean it's it's incredible and your voice you know and and i think that's you know the the writing is great and that's that's a calling you 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 know it's your calling but but what you're doing with it when, as soon as, when you get a voice and that, that is so important. I, I just, you know, see so many people, I'm just disappointed. Well, you're great. You made a touchdown pass or whatever you did, you know, but there, but you know, what do they stand for? Where, you know, other than themselves and you're out there speaking on behalf of those of us that can't, we can't opine in, in the mainstream media, you're doing it. And, and like I said, when I was told, I was literally told in the last four days, uh, well, I've, besides the fact that there's been several say, we'll never touch anything that you've ever done in your life. We don't care if it's war and peace. It's not, mm-hmm. we're going to touch it. But, you know, then recently just not interested in in that, you know, and there you are speaking for us. It's, it's. Um, I mean, you know, I, I tip my hat. I don't, I don't have my cowboy hat on today, but I, I, I tip whatever, I'm, whatever hat they take on. <laughs> Well, no, I sincerely appreciate that. And you're, you're a huge part of this journey and thank you for blurbing the last book, which was incredible, such an honor for me. And people don't know this cause it's only you and I know it. And a couple of people that were standing around that day was that, uh, when I got the phone call that Chris Pratt wanted to do the, uh, or the option, the first novel for the series, uh, which was before the book even came out. It was January first week in January. Uh, I think Dallas Safari Club at the sports uh, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation uh, exactly, little yeah. uh, little thing that they have. Um, we were standing together, and I got that call, and uh, and so you were the first person to know that that Chris Pratt wanted to option this thing for a, a series, which is uh, yeah. which is crazy. So now we're here, you know, all these years later, what three or four years later now, and uh, they're filming it right now out in in L.A. and it's uh, it's looking pretty dang good. Uh, I mean that that's just so cool. I, I mean that this comes out of your head and now the world's going to see it i mean it's uh, anyone that doesn't you know i don't know doesn't tell stories might not know the feeling of of what i'm sure you're feeling i don't know but you know because i'm not there yet but uh but you you've know, been telling I, stories for a long time i mean you've been you are a, a, been doing this at uh, the highest levels for the the longest time with different shows from jim shockey's hunting adventures into the professionals into uncharted i mean these things were were i mean groundbreaking with uncharted of course uh and professionals one of my one of my favorites so we sit down with the, the family those are the those are the only shows that we'd watch really on uh on an outdoor channel and 
we did that when my daughter was was younger and so she feels like she uh you know she grew up with you guys also and she wanted to go hunting at a very early age so she got her first deer at age seven and we've never stopped since we put those ipads away those phones away and we get outside to these places that don't have cell service or you know at least you leave your stuff behind and spend quality time out there together or our son, age 10 now, he, we went to Africa together after I went over there and did some uh, uh, training up of an anti-poaching unit. Uh, yeah. They asked me to come back with my family. So I came back uh, a few months later with my family and our, our little guy got his first animals out there in Africa. And uh, there was a picture that, uh, so we were in that reddish, reddish sand that they have out there. There was a lion print and he went up and he put his, without anybody telling him, he put his hand in the sand next to that lion print and I took a picture of it and it's so cool to see this big paw and then his little handprint next to it and it was just a uh, such a special trip but um but you were a big part of that in uh in uh you know captivating these kids at a young age watching your adventures on tv telling those stories on uh on television and uh and and now here we are as a family it's it's a part of who we are every year that's where we connect because every day here is so busy but where we connect is when we get outside and when we go yeah. field and yeah. uh, it's just such a special place and i know family for you has been a big uh part of your your life as well from hunting with your dad and eva and getting the whole family uh, involved in it in a very natural way and then sharing yeah. that with everybody I, I, you know that's such an important part of of the lifestyle you know hunting is is you know the kill of an animal is just like that it's not it's a t not even a two-dimensional, you know, it's of a sphere. It's a tiny little sliver of it. And, and you know, family is, is to me, the most important part. To be successful, to, you know, to get the accolades for accomplishments means nothing. If, if family, your family values and your family aren't there with you and you weren't part of their, you know, their growth or, I guess, the creation of that, whatever that family unit is, and then on to, you know, our, we have four grandchildren now, you know, it's without that, it's, it's a pretty facile, I don't know, meaningless success. Uh, so, so, you know, family for me is, uh, is extremely important. I've, I've always said that. And that's, yeah. you know, hunting is camaraderie, family, humor, adventure, and animals, you know, it's, but it's not, you know, not the kill. That's not even, even the animal part. That's the time. Yeah. Part of it. So it's, it's uh, it's great to hear that. I didn't realize that your uh, children were into hunting already. That's cool. Oh yeah, yeah. From a very, it was very natural. I didn't push it. We didn't talk about it. Uh, it you know, we had an outdoor channel on in the background and in the evenings, kind of making dinner and that sort of thing. And the kids would be outside. And when we lived in San Diego, uh, when I was still in the SEAL teams, and uh, yeah, our daughter just got you know, I think she saw that and she was just captivated by it. And she started asking questions about it, and you know, very naturally wanted to wanted to go. So. Luckily, uh, you know, I knew a few few people and knew, uh, uh, and we could get out there and and do it. So, um, yeah, so yeah, we we've been we've been getting out at least once a year uh, ever since as a as a family. Um, but yeah, that Africa trip was pretty special. And here's this is, uh, I have this book here. I know that uh, you had a trip uh, <laughs> together that uh, that you talk about. Where uh, I, I think uh, you've got our first animal out there, maybe. Yep, I think uh, I may have the same. Book. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Uh, and she's been so fantastic to, to me as I launched, you know, Oh, look at that. Oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That is fantastic. Yeah. She, she's, she always makes sure that, uh, I know clearly that she has had a book published and I have not. <laughs> well, I was going to, I was going to ask you about that, about, uh, a book that chronicles some of the uh, the, the things you did in Uncharted or the professionals or Jim Shockey's hunting adventures, anything that those, that photography or something that's different than, than what, uh, what we just talked about here, um, with the, with the novel, is there any, have you, have you ever thought about doing anything like that? Sharing some of that photography or the, some of those stories well, in that, in that way? Yeah. You know, I, I actually have right now, and you, you don't know this, but I, I've, I've got a, um, I've, I've kept a journal for 25 years religiously. It, it's, hundreds of thousands of pages and and uh i i actually went uh, through just the bear guiding on vancouver island and did a you know a book and it's it's all edited it's it's actually ready to go to design um so it's at that stage and i've also done two humor books you may not know that either but that's oh. humor is uh I, I wrote in back in the olden days i mean i'm getting old but back in the 
in the 80s um, and early 90s, I, I was back page of many magazines with under a pen name. Okay. And uh, I think I was writing under Ace Tadler and, you know, sometimes under my own name. But but um, so so I have two humor books also completely edited, ready for design. Um, and, and I held off on any publishing of those books and my journals, you know, going through those to, to publish them just because I didn't want them to interfere with what you're holding in your hands there, that novel, Man of Sores. Yeah. Um, I, I just felt, I mean, I, those are no brainers. I can, I can self-publish. I can, or I get a publisher for those and mm. my own audience on social media, I can sell those books. Um, mm. that, it's not the same. It's not the same. And that, that's why when you ask about it, yeah, sure, I can do it. And, and that's, again, a pretty easy project for me to do. I'm not sure how I divide them up by year, the journals, by, you know, trips, yeah. Asia, Africa, right. I mean, I was 300 days a year on the road for 25 years. Amazing. So, you know, I, I could divide it up in a, numerous different ways, but, but I, it's more important to me that that book that you have gets published. And then once it's published, it's, then I can, then it's too late. It's out there. Then I can put out the other books. Um, I, and, and also, you don't know, I've got another novel that I wrote back in 1991 um called the lordly and and it's um it was a, a historic fiction that uh back then i sent her here in canada and and it got i don't know made it out of 2000 submissions made it to the top 10 but they only published three that and that was 91 i can't remember what was going on, something with the economy so there was some other reason so i've got that one as well and and no kidding yeah it's just waiting for uh but but that one that you're holding is is the one that I want out. That's Got it. that's my baby. You know, yeah. in, in effect, that's my life. So, yeah. so the other ones, yeah, I, that was part of what I was doing, and I could talk about you know the trips and and uh, those adventures, you know, in a sort of journal form, tell the story. But I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it that way. Got it. Got so, it. Well, I can see why because this is, I mean, this is special. So this is, yeah, I don't even know. Like I said, it's hard to classify exactly, you know, what you have here. It's uh, it's that special. Um, usually things fit in a category. Uh, but what's cool about not fitting in a category is like the great works out there. I'm, I'm pointing over here because of, of all my books are are stacked up here uh, on, on now across from me. Um, but the, the greats are, are those ones that are that are different that you can't put into a category. So, I mean, that's. And, and, and sometimes when I'm going through a, through a, when I'm reading something, I say, ah, oh, you know, what would an edit, I could read it kind of have an editorial eye because I'm reading, doing my stuff. I'm kind of editing as I go, which they tell you not to do, but I'm kind of doing that anyway, because I have to get to a, a, get a chapter to a place where I'm happy with it, knowing that I'm going to go back and refine it a little bit more. But there's a, once again, another intangible, getting that chapter to a place where I feel good enough to go on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't spend like, you know, a year on it. I don't spend a month on it. Um, it'll be a couple of days, few days, sometimes one day, sometimes three days, but, uh, whatever it takes to get that chapter to that point where I'm like, okay, I can move on now where I'm not in the next chapter thinking back, oh man, did I leave that chapter too early? I could have done, spent a little more time on it. I, so I have to get it to that, whatever that point is before sure. I move on. And so oftentimes I read things with that editorial eye and, uh, in this one, zero things they know that I would more for zero things that I had questions about. And I don't think very rare anyway, I'll say that, um, for me to ha have that especially, and it is almost never that I have it with, uh, with fiction. Um, although there's, I mean, there's so much that's not fiction in here. It's hard to classify once again, uh, which makes it, which is wonderful for me to have, to have something that's so different and so special. So, um, yeah, we'll talk offline. We're going to, we got to come up with a, with a couple of courses of action, as we'd say in the, in the military, uh, a couple of contingency plans, uh, a main effort, some supporting efforts, some contingency plans. So we'll, 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 we'll put some thought into this. Perfect. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I, but again, you know, th this is your podcast. It's not about me. So <laughs> oh, it's about, you know, no, I love, I, I'm using this thing as an excuse to catch up also. So it's, uh, yeah, that, it's a perfect excuse for me to get to get, talk to yeah, friends and, yeah. and get to, to catch up, uh, that we probably wouldn't do because we're both so busy. You probably wouldn't just jump on an hour long phone call just to, uh, to catch up. So this, uh, allows us yeah, to, that's, to I'm sure everybody's that. listening to me. We're just like, this is just a phone call, but <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which is the best part about it. Yeah. But, uh, Speaking of catching up, so what is behind you? Is this your office? Is this part of the museum? Is this in uh, the house or? Yeah, I would have loved to have had this set up at the museum, but this is in my office at my home. 
Wow. Um, the museum is, is way cooler. Hey. Well, the museum is pretty special. So that opened in, what, 2019? Yeah, 2019. We, we opened the doors. No big, great, you know, grand opening or anything. It was people came to the front door, then we let them in. I think we may have put sandwich boards out on the, the main road there. It's, it's a pretty out-of-the-way place. Okay. Um, in, in a, you know, well-heeled little community. They didn't even know it was there. Uh, the, the local. So we put the sandwich boards out and then we put a billboard on the highway, you know, for hand of man museum of natural history, cultural arts and conservation. Yeah. So, so give us a little, a little background on that. Cause I, you know, wasn't aware that you were doing it until you first posted about it. I think you gave a few hints and talked about it a little bit. And the first one I saw, I was like, wait, what's he doing? How, one, one, how does he have time to, to do all this? And, and, and wow, I just had no idea like the depth with which you uh, understood and, and studied and collected um, all these things. Um, and uh, so how did it all come about? How did that, it's been a lifelong journey, obviously, but yeah, how does it, how did it culminate in this, uh, in this museum? Well, my, you know, loving soulmate of 36, a little tired of everything being packed in here, you know, it's, <laughs> Louise was, uh, well, she burst into tears when I bought the building because it was a derelict. It was, a, our kids went to school there. So it's a 17,000 square foot school. That's a mile from our house. And, uh, our kids went from grade one to grade six. You could go to that school and then it got too small, wouldn't meet seismic, wouldn't meet fire code. So they, uh, decommissioned the school in 2001 wow. and it basically sat there until 2014 when we, we bought it, it was squatters living in there. It was, uh, it was a mess. Uh, I took four 40 foot containers of garbage, actual people's garbage from inside, uh, roof caving in. There was no heaters, no wiring, no, all the copper pipes were stripped. So that's the building that I bought. I said, oh, this is my, you know, I'll get rid of all the junk in the house. So, uh, yeah, she burst into tears. But, but it was that museum, I knew that I would do that when I was 10 years old. That's, I could have told you at 10 years of age what was going to be in that museum. And, and I, wouldn't, I didn't know where. You know, we were dirt poor. We lived in a trailer park and and had no money, but um, I knew what would be in it. I didn't know where or how I'd pay for it. So so it just got to a point of gathering for fifty years that um, it was time to to give it a venue, give it a home. And you you don't you, you know this. You don't own anything. I can collect all I want, but you don't own any of these things that are in this room. I don't own them. I, I'm a steward of them. For now, they they belong to everybody. Especially if if you've had the ability, like I've had, you know, you read the book to travel the world and and uh, gather art and artifacts from around the world for fifty years, really, and last twenty five, pretty steady. Actually, not the last couple. That's slowed down significantly. <laughs> well, well, you had a good run there for for a while, though. It's probably, I mean time to, to take a breath and then put that focus on the, on the museum and, and build that up. And, uh, so 2014, you bought it. So that's a few years of cleaning out that garbage, getting it ready, yeah. figuring out a floor plan, figuring out where everything's going to go. Um, did you do that all yourself, figure out what was going to go in what place, or did you hire somebody that could come in and kind of well, design I, I, it? No, I've grown up to become an interior decorator. I knew what the answer was going to be, by the way, but I just felt like I needed uh, to no, every, every single little display, all the you know, fish hooks and the seashells. And, you know, I, 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 I'm a stickler for detail and, and uh, might, some might even say obsessive about it. So, so I, every single thing in there, I've done the displays and I've placed the displays, um, organized the installations. I, I, there's, art is, a, is a, an important thing in my life and, and there's an art uh, in display if it's done properly. And, and I think what happens in many museums, and I'm, you know, this is probably a little negative, but it, it's the truth. Uh, when, you, when you try and make education the primary focus of, of a museum, you lose the, the point that it's got to be entertainment first and you educate with entertainment. It's like storytelling. Yeah. You can educate, you can teach people, you got to entertain them or you're going to lose them. I mean, who I, I go to museums, some of the best museums and I, you know, it's like, oh, I check my pulse here alive. <laughs> and 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 it's because I you you know, I can't read through 
pages of, or, you know, the big board and people walk in front, you can't focus. So, so this museum is, there's none of that. It's uh, state of the art. I've never seen it anywhere around the world. So I, I'm calling it state of the art because I haven't seen it, but it's just little tiny numbers like an Easter egg hunt. You have to look for the numbers. And then we've got iPads because as you know, we've been filming for this entire time. So we've got archival footage going back 25 years and, and from everywhere around the world. And we can gather those clips and bits and pieces and tell the story of each piece that's there on an actual iPad, two to three minutes done, you know, you're on to the next thing. And that, that's about how long you can capture somebody nowadays. Um, you know, two to three minutes at a, a museum. And it, what's interesting about this museum, and I mean, we don't have pictures over video, and, you know, people could see it, but it, it uh, it's the only museum that I know of that the children are bringing the parents and the grandparents. Oh, wow. It's, it's every single day the kids come in and, and you know, I'll, say, I'll ask the adults, so how are you enjoying the museum? And they say, well, you didn't know it existed. You know, <laughs> they, they said we had to come and there. The kids have the iPads. In the beginning, we were, because it's very interactive. It's, you know, you're within inches of anything you want. Um, there's no glass. Oh, wall. wow. Okay. Biting you. There's glass cases, but, but not yeah. the majority of the pieces are right there. You can put your nose two inches from them. And we thought, well, maybe we should have a limit on the age limit on the kids. But uh, the kids are the best. They don't touch anything. They have the iPad. <laughs> and they, okay. They're working the iPad. It's the adults that it. lean on something or <laughs> want to touch something. It's, it, anyway, yeah. when you get a chance, you got to come up and see it. And oh, you, yeah. No, I plan on it. I want to do that like we planned, actually, for maybe this spring and COVID. Who knows? Yeah. It was called crazy. And getting into Canada was, I don't know, it was just very complicated even friends that were down here when covid kicked out they just stayed they didn't even go go home we, they stayed we did the same thing this winter we, we have a place down in pinehurst north carolina and, and uh, we were going to come home after christmas we went there in november so why it, you know canada's locked down and we we finally came back april 1st and you know wow. two weeks quarantine three negative tests you had to three days mandatory in a hotel a thousand dollars a night you know and wow. and and now masks everywhere and and we've had our two vaccines months ago, you know, and, and Canada has just been behind the eight ball. Um, uh, you know, I'm starting now. Some of our friends are getting the first shot. Okay. Oh, wow. The second one isn't scheduled for four months for anybody. So, wow. so yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's bizarre to me, but uh, somebody, somebody at very high level dropped the ball in our country and, and there's no way we should be, you know, behind Morocco and, in, in, yeah. you know, no offense to Moroccans, but, yeah. you know, heck, your neighbor is the United States. You guys are all vaccinated, or, you know, if you want it, your choice and you're opening up, you know, Canada, I don't, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, talk to me in six months, but I, I yeah. think we're going to lose our second outfitting season. We already lost our second spring. I think we're going to lose our second you know, fall in the Yukon. <sighs> which Second fall. Damn. Yeah. What is it doing to other, I mean, um, to, to outfitters that don't have these other things going on, um, it, it, concessions, fishing up there. Like we were going to go up to, uh, what used to be called the queen Charlotte's. What is it now? The Hilda Gwaii. Is that Hilda you, Hilda Gwaii. Okay. Um, so we've been up there a few times and, uh, yeah, I'll, it was just not knowing made it the decision a no, even if it was a possibility because you have to plan so much out. Of course, everybody has so much going on. You're juggling kids, you're juggling schedules. I'm juggling yeah. filming and all these other things. So when something's so uncertain, it just becomes a, a no. Um, and, or, Hey, we'll just see, we'll try it again next year or uh, two years from now. So I, I assume that's happening to, to outfitters across Canada. Yeah. Yeah. That that's from your side as a client. Yeah. From the outfitter side, it, we don't know that it's a no, so we have to constantly be, you know, ready to open the doors. Yeah. If they say tomorrow, you know, May 21st, we're going to open up for Americans to come up, then we have to be ready to go. So we have all the expenses. Wow. We can't yeah. just shut down and say, okay, for a year and a half, everybody right. gets off and Ugh. have a holiday. We have to keep the doors. Like, you know, it's like keeping ready to go running the whole time. Just, and then once in a while, you got to rev it up, got to shut it down, get a, you know, maintain it then start it up again and keep it going ready to go so it, it, unfortunately there's going to be a lot of outfitters up in canada and, and fishing camps that um, aren't going to survive this uh you know they, they've been you know deposits are in what do you think all that money is that they're keeping the doors or ready to go that's wow. deposits and when the time comes well you can't take it even for the balance you can't take somebody because 
you end up losing money. They're just going to declare bankruptcy. It, it's it's going to be a, a we haven't had our medicine yet on this. Yeah, it'll be cod liver oil, and it, and it won't be good for you. Cod liver oil. It's just just going to be our medicine. We're going to have to take it. So, uh, so brutal. Like I say, I'm not in, I'm not king of the world. If you if I ever run for king of the world, please vote for me because of course. And if you run, I'll vote for you. We, <laughs> we just I'll need, be VP. Yeah, there you go. We we need common sense at the highest levels, and and it's been lacking, you know, because people don't make decisions on what's best for the people that they're supposed to be leading. Yeah, not ruling, leading. They're they're making decisions based on can I get elected, and and this is a, you know, it, it's a anyway. That's a pretty deep conversation. I'm sure you weren't planning to head that direction, but it, it's uh, we're going to have to sort that out sooner than later because they've got to start making decisions that are best for the people and the citizens of these countries, Canada, the United States, two greatest countries on the planet. Although there's Australians out there who argue and you know, <laughs> New Zealanders are, are, yeah, are yeah. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, because your your audience is worldwide. So crazy. I shouldn't say that. In my opinion. <laughs> but, uh, That's all right. We don't have to be too careful here. But uh but yeah as soon as things you know, open up. Uh, hopefully next spring we'll get out there, Vancouver Island, do the, uh, you know, get up there together. I'd love to see the museum and, and see you guys and have a drink and and uh, and go after some black bear and all that sort of thing. And then at some point, I'd love to get up to the Yukon territory with you as well. That would be amazing. Most pure wilderness left in this world. Yeah. It is it is spectacular. You, you got to come bring your, bring your, yeah. your boat. Oh, I will. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will. It's, it's, uh, I, 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 you know, Again, it's it's one of those things where words can't. How do you describe something? And you know, I, I you know, I've written a thousand articles, and you know, you have the results of some of my efforts in front of you. But there just are things that can't be described in words. That I I'm not good enough. Maybe someone is, but if they are, I haven't read it yet. And and that's you know, no offense, but the, the when you stand up there, it, I think it's touching your ancestral soul. Yeah. You're, you're, it's, it's, it's not your primal. It's not that you're primitive. It's, uh, you know, again, I keep coming back to the word pure, but there just isn't enough words, but you come up there. There's one. Yeah, so no, I can't wait. And th- there's been a few times where I've seen things that I've, I, I, I reach for my camera or my iPhone to take a picture of, and I stop and I don't do it. Um, because I know that the photograph isn't going to capture the feeling. Uh, and I want to remember the, I don't want to ruin it with, by taking the photo. So I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm conflicted about that, especially if I'm with the kids or the family, I'm like, let's get it quick, get in there and do this. Um, but there are definitely things that I, places that I've been and, and scenes and landscapes that I can remember that I did not take a photo of just because I didn't want to ruin it with that technology. I just wanted to feel it. Yeah. Um, I, I hear you. I, I almost, I, again, you know, back to the novel that, that I think sometimes Art is the only way an artist, an artist can sometimes capture it. A great, great artist in a moment of inspiration that maybe happens once in their lifetime, twice, who knows? Yeah. Um, I think there, they, there's some kind of a, you know, they're the, the voice of that feeling and, and yeah. you know, figuratively speaking. I, but yeah, you can't, I don't know. I, I, I'm with you 100%. You take a picture, it kind of, denigrates the yeah it doesn't it doesn't pay enough respect i don't know it's yeah, a, something like yeah, that it's not right it's two-dimensional it's you can't yep. but you you come up there there's one spot i'll you and i'll stand on there and you'll see awesome. 30 miles this way 30 miles this way three miles across the valley flat and you know moose and the mountain birch are red and the or the willows are yellow and the caribou moss is white and the peaks will be in snow it, it it just, like I say, like I can blabber about it and I can, you know, show you a picture, but it's, you got to be there. So, oh, no, I can't wait. I can't. Wait. Well, you've done an amazing job capturing that the way you have over the years um, with all the, with the different shows and everything else that, that you've done, really bringing that, that to people and inspiring people to go out, even if it's not hunting, just to get out after whatever they want to get out at yeah. in life. Um, so, so you've, you, I mean, you've, you brought the, you've introduced so many 
he reconnected them, I think, is a way to, to put it. Because we're all, I think, somehow connected to the land. We're connected to those animals. Um, somehow, deep down inside us, we're removed. But it's such a slim section of our, our existence as human beings uh, that we've been able to outsource that defense to call 911 in this country or to, to go down to the grocery store and pick something off, off the shelf. That is like this much, if that much, of human history. The rest of it, we had to be connected to the land. We had to be connected to the animals. We had to be connected to these tools that allowed us to put food on the table and then defend the tribe, defend our families, defend that gift of life. And uh, there's something inside us. It's still in there. It has to be because everyone has ancestors that were good at those things, or at least they had friendships with people that were good yeah, <laughs> at those yeah, things, yeah. made some alliances there. They were smart enough to do that. Um, so it's in there somewhere. So when they see that show, when they see you standing up there, they see you in one of these countries that you're in, especially with Uncharted, where you guys captured that um, was was incredible. Um, it stirs something in in you and uh in in these peoples and and regardless of what they want to do in life i think it inspires them whether they're going to climb some ten thousand foot mountain somewhere after some exotic animal or just start, paint a picture or do something that they that uh that they've been putting off uh i think there's there's so many other things just besides uh show kind of kind of uh chronicling the journey of the hunt that, uh, that you've done for people through these, this, uh, visual meeting medium of the, the shows that you've done. Um, and I think that's probably the, the biggest benefit to people out there that never set foot a field, but do something that they, that they've wanted, they've been putting off because they saw what you did. Um, and it, they're so inspired by it that now, now they go down and they learn how to sail or they, you know, do that thing that they wanted to do, or they go, go to Machu Picchu or whatever it is, whatever that thing is that they wanted to do that they've been putting off and they see what you're out, out there doing and they're inspired. And then off they go to do their own do that thing that they've been putting off for so long which is really cool i think yeah that, that we've all that's been our goal you know to awaken that in people and and not not to motivate them that comes that comes from yourself motivation is internal but you know to inspire them inspire. to act you know yep, and, yep. And, and i've said it a million times you know we get one life we get one life there's no redos and and do-overs and so if it if you get one life why would you spend any of it, you know, not living it like you would want to live. I mean, it, it makes no sense. Now, of course, there's rules, but you, you, you have to, you know, make your decisions on and not let somebody make decisions for you and say, well, I got to do this because they say, it. no, no, you don't. No, you can live your life. And, and if it means going out and learning how to sail, go do it. You know, and that, that, that freedom, I think that self-determination self-reliance and you know self-confidence they they're all tied together yeah and and uh if we if we've inspired people then i i would i would be thrilled that i you know think that when i you know finally close my eyes forever that uh that was that was a, a life well spent and, and so when i hear this again from you i didn't come on this so uh, to get my head's going to get this big i'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to get a bigger size hat <laughs> Oh, uh, no, no, I think you've, you've, you've definitely done that. You've definitely been an inspiration to me and countless others. Um, and where did you think you first, was that innate, uh, essentially from birth, just knowing that, Hey, we have one ride on this planet. I'm going to make the, the most of it. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to, uh, contribute, uh, like, where did that come from? Cause, uh, you know, growing up, uh, where did you, where did you, I think you got your first deer at age, uh, like 13, 14, somewhere in there. Right. Um, and then when did you decide you were going to go down this path into what was called the hunting industry, or you were going to be an outfitter, or you were going to be, have, have some touch point with this natural world. Was that just from birth or did, was there some point along the way where you realized, Hey, you know what? I've got one ride on this planet. This is my passion. I'm on it. Yeah. You know, I, I absolutely, I was a hunter. My earliest memories are, and I, I think I was only about two or three years old. My dad and my uncles were tearing down a, a, an old granary. And, and I remember being at the farm and, and uh, turning over bricks and seeing earthworms and beetles and, and you know, trying to catch them. I mean, it, that's hunter. I, I was a hunter from that, you know, then mice later on and gophers and rabbits you know, where I could actually start to bring food. I did bring the mice and the gophers back. My mom wasn't too impressed with that. And, uh, you know, apparently they weren't something you're, you were supposed to eat. But once I got into rabbits and whatnot, I, you know, th then you really start seeing the full cycle. You know, life begets death, begets life, begets death. So, so I was a hunter, but, but that doesn't, you know, the, the, you know it was a two-part question. It, you know, I, I watched my dad. He grew up in the, in the dirty 30s. And, and uh, you know, 
no money, dirt poor. And, and he got a job and he stayed at that job for 40 years, 45 years. And I, I remember the, the conversations at the dining room table were always the same. Was he going to get la- laid off next month? You know, would we have enough money to buy food? This, this, I, my youngest memories of, of dinner conversations. And, and I watched my dad and, and uh, saw how he had his soul sucked out of him doing, you know, he was good at what he did. There's no question. And he took pride in what he did. You know, if you're going to be a ditch digger, you be the best darn ditch digger. You know, any job worth doing is worth doing well. Uh, but he, he had choices taken away from him. I, I you know, I'd, I'd like to believe that, you know, in my case, I looked at, a, at that at a very young age. Like I say, I grew up in a trailer park. Uh, one, one of the reasons our museum is donation only is because I would have loved a place like that. I would have lived there. I would have been the curator's nightmare. I'd have been there every single day. Uh, but if there was a cover charge, I could never have gone to it, period. So our museum is donation only. And, and that's just for that one little me out there somewhere that doesn't have enough money, but it, you know that's who they are. They, they, you know, wow. they can walk through there every single day, not pay a penny. And, and so I, watching my dad and my mom struggle, and uh, I just determined at that point that no one was ever going to lord over me. Uh, I was never going to, I was, I was effectively unemployable at, at a very young age because I wanted to determine my own destiny. And I wanted to be who I was going to be and what I wanted to be. And I wanted to fail and succeed on me, not because someone decides I can get a, a raise and, and, and you know, a promotion. I mean, someone decides that for me. You've got to be kidding me. It was uh, so, so I was, I don't know, maybe it's something, but I, I was different than my father in that sense. You know, I don't <laughs> I remember um, 1981 interest rates went up to 23% or whatever. I fancy myself a real estate developer and I was building three apartment blocks in the interior of British Columbia and had 10 houses going up. Now I was, I didn't, it wasn't my money. It was other people's money, OPM and uh, other people's land. But I, I was the project manager and I was going to be a millionaire and, and interest rates went to 21%. And I walked away with, you know, uh, like uh my dog and my stereo and it was a crappy dog and a crappy stereo <laughs> and a crappy car. And that was all I had, but nobody lost money. And, you know, everybody got yeah. paid back everything. But um, a couple of years later, when the interest rates started coming down again, I got a call from a big developer saying, Hey, come and work for me. So I called my dad and, you know, I mean, it was a pretty hard hit in 1981. I was in my early twenties. And uh, my, I said, dad, what should I do? Take this job or, or, you know, should I try again, something different, you know, just my own. And he said, you know what the right thing to do is, you know, you take that job and you be thankful for the job. And, 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 uh, you know, it was like a flashback and I said, Whoa. And I, you know, phoned the guy, the developer up and I thanked my dad very much for his advice. And then I phoned the developer and said, not in a million years. And I went into, <laughs> I went into ethnocentric art is what I did was dealing in art. Uh, really? Okay. That yeah. But I mean, I was, I'm talking about starting with $50 art. Yeah. I was looking in garage sales for, for great art. Well, you read the, you read the book. I read it. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. How th- there's so much personal, I mean, it's amazing that the water polo is in here, of course. And I knew that part because I've seen you post some of those great old flashback Fridays or throwback Thursday pictures or whatever. I love those from the seventies and eighties. Yeah, and yeah. you know, those are amazing pictures. I love when you do that, but, uh, that's incredible. So you got, went into artwork like that, finding, tracking these things down. And then what did you do with them at that, at that point, when you found something, what did you do? I, I, um, I sold them. I mean, that's, I, I restored them and, and sold them. Uh, uh, I had some pretty fancy clientele. I mean, Ralph Lauren eventually came in and bought out my entire inventory of the sort of commercial grade stuff. We furnished all his, uh, yeah, his, his <laughs> Ralph Lauren country yeah. stuff when he was, uh, you know, he had the polo stores, but he tried country stores. And so we I think he, he did six and we, we furnished all those and, uh, Amazing. And and then I use that money to get into outfitting because I kind of walked from that. There wasn't the treasure hunting part of it is a very important part for me. And I had combed Western Canada for those ethnocentric folk 
forms, the vernaculars like uh, Dukovar, Mennonite, Hutterite, Ukrainian, wow. ethnocentric furniture, idiosyncratic folk art as well, but uh, mostly mostly on the ethnic side, and uh, and and there just wasn't any anything left. So I, I used to take truckloads down to uh, it was in the book uh, down to Hollywood, and and Amazing. we would empty out one of my clients' homes and, and cater and valet parking and flowers and, and then invite all the, the uh, movie stars in and they would buy the stuff out of the house. We delivered and then put all the furniture back in the house and, and head back up to Canada. That's so, incredible. So that's, yeah, that's why, you know. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that's incredible. I didn't know that part was, uh, was real. That's incredible. I, I'm telling uh, you, there's very, that's amazing. Stuff that's not real. Wow. So they, I mean, wow. That's a percentage. Jeez. Uh, I caught the Ralph Lauren, of course, reference, and I caught the Chris Pratt reference also. Yeah, yeah. That was very cool. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. Uh, that's so when did you make this transition then to uh, becoming an outfitter or did you apprentice first? And did you have to go through this Canada, have that kind of the, the, a guide program where you work your way up kind of like a, a Canada or a uh, Alaska has those uh, apprenticeship program or not programs, but the years you have to spend at these different levels. How did, how did that transition from doing this art and selling this art? Transition well, into becoming an outfit. Well, well, I had I had three stores in Vancouver, antique stores, art stores, and folk art interiors was the name. And I, I uh, in between, you know, the slow days and there were slow days, I started writing. So this would have been 1984. I, I wrote my first hunting article, and 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 always my intention from a young age has been in the hunting industry. I didn't know if I'd be, you know, Bill Jordan selling camo patterns or or t-shirts. I didn't know. I just wanted to be in the outdoor you know, hunting, fishing industry somehow. Um, thank goodness I didn't know about mountain climbing back then, being born in Saskatchewan. I, I'm telling you, I would have been the, the 14,000 uh, or the, the 14,000 meter peaks or what are they? Um, well, you've done, I mean, it looks like you've done quite a bit of that type of thing, especially if people go back and watch uh, watch some of the, the Uncharted stuff. Yeah. Um, but, um, oh my goodness. But I, I would... Uh, I, you know, I, those draw me like a, a moth to a flame. I would have died on the mountain. I, I, cause to me, unlike Ed Beaster's, you know, it said, you know, it's, what is it imperative getting to the top is optional. Getting down is, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't live my life like that. It was, you know, no attaining the goal was imperative yeah. and then figure out a way to get home. If you have to jump, you jump, you know, but I would have died. So I'm glad I didn't know about that, but I, I did, uh, I started writing for hunting magazines back in 1984 as I was doing the uh, ethnocentric art and uh, you can you go get old country living magazines. 1984, actually I dabbled in modeling as well. I there was, you go. That's in the, in the book. There we go. Vogue magazine. You can look it up. 1984 that, September there, you know, that's amazing. In the same jacket that you describe in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, exactly. that's incredible. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's just like, like, you know, back to what we were talking about earlier, you get one life. So, so why not, why not live the life that you are destined to live, not a life that someone else tells you you have to live or should live or for whatever reason, you know, I'm a doctor son, so you got to be a doctor. No, you don't. You know, my dad was a road construction superintendent yeah, and, and a heavy duty mechanic. I'm sure his, and, and a pilot that he had to mm -hmm. stop flying when he got married because he couldn't afford, you know, to actually fly his own airplane. So, wow. so he, uh, he gave that up. You know, so he, I, yeah. I mean, he read every single airplane magazine that ever existed and had to live vicariously through a, you know, a, a 49 cent magazine and, and listen to the airplanes talk on his little, I don't know, VHF, whatever yeah. channel okay. they're on. And, and, you know, but he, he couldn't fly. You know, didn't have the money, had to raise kids and, you know, bought one gun in his life that got stolen eventually out of my safe in our ranch. But anyway, lot, that's another story. You get, you get, you get one life. So, you know, live it, live it. I, I say, you know, people are afraid of, of failing, you know, afraid of, well, I, I don't know if I can do that. And it, what if I fail? You know, I, and I say, if, if you spend your whole life sitting on a couch at home, worried about what might happen, nothing ever will. That'll be it. That'll be it. Your entire life will be on that couch. Nothing happened. You know, good job. 
you know, you got to get out there and, and try things. And to me, I've, I've never been afraid to try. <laughs> I've suffered the slings and arrows, you know, it doesn't really hurt that bad. It's like, you don't like me really, you know, I, I'm, I'm no less a person because I fail. If that novel never gets published, you know, it won't be, it won't be because I'm a lesser, I'm not, I don't take that person. I know how good it is. Yeah. I know how good I am. I know what I've done. So, so I, that's what, when you live your life true to who you are, you, you never have a regret ever. Yeah. I can't even imagine being on my deathbed and, Oh, you know, there was one thing I wish. No, no, there's nothing. And you know, you lived it, you know, you know, you know, I mean, I don't know if they're in the thousands, hundreds, you know, lots of people that, that uh, live that same thing. Yeah. And it, and it's, that's when you can look somebody in the eye, anybody in the eye and say, yeah, I'm your equal. You know, there's nobody better. There may, you know, you we, equal. Yes. But nobody better. And you know, it sounds arrogant, but it's not, it's just, it's just, you know who you are. And, and, you know, this is uh, the best I can be. And, and that's how I've always lived my life. Uh, fearlessly and and uh and and as honestly truthfully with honor i mean all those those good things you know yeah. Dude, that is that is amazing that is amazing and i know we're, we're coming up on time i could talk to you for hours and hours but i love what you just said right there so i might want to want to want to finish it off on, on that because like you said so many people just for whatever reason they they do spend time thinking about that failure and worried about that failure and not getting off that, not giving it a shot and not knowing that, Hey, these failures are going to make, build this character that I can then turn future future. I can turn that into wisdom going forward and that I can pass along these lessons to my kids so that we all get better and, and get stronger as, as a family, as a society, and we keep moving forward. Um, so that's for me, that's kind of the, uh, I don't know when I look at what's going on out there today and I look at our, our three kids, here and uh and all the distractions that they have in the the world that they're even if they're you know we're shielding i mean it's not really shielding because it's they're getting these inputs uh all the time all day every day from the devices to the teachers to wearing masks to just seeing people in masks um and all that sort of thing. it's just a, a it's a strange kind of feeling that's out there in the air and so i always try to encourage people to get into pages of books get into like this one right here, this amazing book that you wrote right here. We're going to talk about, we're going to come up with a plan. We're going to get this out there because it's so special. It's so incredible. Um, but I encourage everybody to get in the pages of these novels, get in the pages of, of these books, put the requisite time, energy, and effort into the study of history so that we can make good decisions for future generations. Because we live, both of us live in countries where people sacrifice so much so we could have these freedoms and these options and opportunities that we do. Um, and whether it was uh, in our families or if it was uh, people we didn't even know for the most part, sacrificing everything so that we could be free. And uh, we owe them the, that time spent in the pages of these books so that we can make good decisions going forward. And we're not, um, discrediting their memory, discrediting what they did for us by taking away these freedoms that we've been, been given. So, um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to figure out how to get this thing, this thing out there. Cause it is, it is so special. And, uh, we're also going to figure out a way to get together in Lanai again, because, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't make it out there with you the last time you were out there with John Dubin at, uh, at Pineapple Brothers out there. Uh, and it's so special for me to be involved in that, in that place, such a great area for families to get together, especially if some of them aren't hunting, uh, they can lie by the pool and have a dinner at Nobu or whatever else, but it's a, it's a pretty cool place. So we'll get you back out there. And of course, you're always welcome to, to come on out and we'll, we'll, we'll figure, figure it all, it all out and, and, uh, and get out there and enjoy that Island. It's a pretty special place. Perfect. And the Yukon. You're, ah, you're on Hawaii, oh, Yukon, Vancouver Island. It's uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. Sounds wonderful. Sounds wonderful. And uh, speaking of that one life to live and, and, and all the rest of that, what you've done so much, uh, you inspired so many people. What, when you look ahead now, what are you, what are you seeing uh, ahead? Uh, what's that path ahead? You have this museum, you have this amazing art, you're passing on all this, uh, this uh, all this knowledge, all this wisdom, all this uh, inspiration. Like, what do you see next in the next 10 years going forward? Do you look that far ahead or what are you, what oh, are you yeah. thinking? Oh yeah, no, no. I, I uh, well, number one, I, I have to get down to a, a scratch golfer 
You know, that's, <laughs> that's right. I didn't talk to you about golf. <laughs> yeah, got a, got a shot 74 yesterday with two. When did you get that bug? When did you get the golfing bug? I, I've had one lesson and one set of clubs because uh, a dear friend was on the board at Callaway. So I have a great set of clubs, one lesson, one charity golf tournament, but that's my golfing experience. Uh, yeah, I was 40. Uh, I'd never golfed before in my life. So like I said, we didn't grow up with anything like that. That was fancy. Um, but when I was 40, I was driving by a golf course and I, I looked and there was a bunch of guys in their 60s, 70s golfing. And, you know, it's a, it's a, a sport, you know, it's a, you have to be an athlete and, and I, you know, water polo, football, baseball, I can do all that stuff, but you can't do it at 40, no matter what anybody thinks, it just looks dumb, but those <laughs> guys were good. And, and I was looking at them, they were carrying their clubs and they're walking and I, you know, kind of checked it. It's like six miles to walk and you carry your clubs up and down hills and you swing and you bend over and do all kinds of stuff. So I thought, yeah, that's, that's a, a sport that I'm going to pick up now so that when I'm old, I can play it. So I, I went out with, uh, I remember it was two professional hockey players, my brother-in-law and me, and he's a fairly decent golfer. They, they shot seven 83 and my brother-in-law shot 93. I shot 137 and I didn't cheat. I said, I want to know the rules. So I have a, you know, a benchmark. Here's where I'm going to start. 137. I was never so humiliated. <laughs> I, I thought I was an athlete, you know, good hand-eye coordination. How hard can this be? Just hit a stupid little ball. <laughs> Holy smokes. Did I learn? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, I was humbled. And uh, so I, I, I practiced from when I was 40 to 50. And then I traveled too much for 10 years. And when we bought our place in Pinehurst, North Carolina, kind of Gulf central um, and our son-in-law, Tim Brent, ex professional hockey player, yeah. He's he's a scratch golfer, so I such you know, a great guy. Yeah, so, great guy. So I, so nice. as father in law, I had to uh, step up to the plate again. So at sixty, I started playing again. And uh, let me tell you something from from fifty to sixty, you lose a lot of. <laughs> but, so for the I'm sixty three now. The last three years, I've been just fighting to get back down to where I was when I quit at fifty. So I shot seventy four yesterday, and that's you know nice. down to about a six handicap. So it's it's getting there. But I, I'd love you know so. Back to your question, uh, you know, I'd love to play in the super senior 65 years of age and be competitive uh, just on the athletic side, just to keep me, you know, the, those juices flowing, the competitive juices. But honestly, I, I figured I'd be writing. I, I honestly yeah. thought I've always, from when I, again, I started my first novel when I was 10, same time as that museum. And, and, and I mean, I've got, you know, false starts all the way through my life. And, and you know, it just wasn't time. And now it is time and, and I've got the time. And so it, it's been a little bit frustrating. I got to tell you to be able to spend so much time at golf and not the thing that I, you know, was pulling here at my heart that I want to get these, these novels out there, get them done. And, and uh, so I, that's what I'd planned. Now I've also been approached to uh, run for the conservative party up here in Canada federally. I was wondering uh, about that. Yeah, I, 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 they asked me 25 years ago, too, and I said, no, um, I had a life I wanted to live that wasn't in politics. Uh, you know, now I, I have I really seriously considered recently this last one I, when they asked, I, I, because if good people don't step up, and I don't know, I'm judging myself as a good person, just somebody with common sense that cares about the citizen. I'm not doing it for money. I don't care if you get reelected or I do. You just need some direction in, in this world and, and when everybody's too afraid to step up to the plate because who needs it you really want to get crucified by you know every idiot that wants to take you down for no reason other than they just don't like the way you think you know it's so so good people have to start stepping forward that's what democracy that's how it works so i you know i, I thought okay well, maybe i will throw my but then i i actually turned it down because i thought i'd be writing the sequel already. And you know, the time that takes, so you cannot yeah. be running back and forth to Ottawa or capital and, and, uh, and be running the country or, or at least contributing to the running of the country and writing a novel. So I, I said no to them. So I, my, my hope is that it, that wasn't, you know, I didn't, uh, throw that away, but I did tell them that the next election that I would be, uh, you know, come and talk to me then I'll, you know, I'll be older, wiser by four years. And, and hopefully have the next couple of sequels done. And unlike yourself, who's got a whole lifetime <laughs> ahead of him. Yeah, my years are limited. Yeah. It's time to give back yeah. to to our society, to you know, uh, you know, my fellow Canadians is yeah. how I feel. So wow, that's amazing. So when is that? When would you have to make a decision on that? Then you have to 
to well, this, campaign and the whole thing? How does yeah, that yeah, you, you'd have to do all that. I mean, you, you have to get uh, nominated, first of all. And then, you, you know, you have to win the nomination for the party that you're running for. And then then you have to campaign against the other parties. And in our constituency here that I live, it's 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 way left wing. So, so you know, there really isn't a conservative voice here at all. Um, but I'm not saying that the fellow that's there isn't, you know, doesn't have good intentions. They do. Everybody does. Well, well not, that's not true. That's, <laughs> what did I just say? Wash my mouth out with soap. Every politician has good intentions. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I just think there we've, we're not balanced right now and, and there needs to be some kind of balance. If you're way out here, you know, you're not, listening to here, how can you possibly be, you know, centered and we need to be centered. So if I have to be a little bit more, you know, this direction to balance this in the center, fine, I'll try. But, but I wouldn't, this next election that's going to get called, our, our prime minister is going to have to call something here pretty quick. They call dropping the writ. Um, I won't run in that. I already said no, but, but four years One from after that, yeah, then, then I'll be ready. Cause it, hopefully by then this novel's out and I've written the two that's sequels. Right. I, you know, unlike you, I don't have, you know, my life is going to be my life. The novels are done and I've got the other books all ready to go so they can, they can go out. But, uh, but, uh, you know, to finish off that story that you have there, I, I do need two more novels uh, beyond that one. And I don't even have one right now. I've got a manuscript. Okay. So, so if I can get that done and then I, I would absolutely throw my name in the hat for the uh, next wow. election. But amazing. If I'm, I'm gonna have to move up to Canada just so I can vote for you. Well, you don't, but it, it, with your following, a, 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 a good word here and there goes a long way. It really, oh. truly does, and it's appreciated if nothing else. It's uh, oh my gosh, it'd be my my honor to to help support in any way I possibly can. So they would be lucky to have you in there, and all of us that uh, uh, are free thinkers and uh, know the value of self reliance and appreciate the the freedoms that we have. Uh, you'd be I can't I can't think of anybody better. So uh, cool. I hope you do it. Right, right back at you. Anything I can ever do. This is mutual admiration society. So, you know, keep doing what you're doing. I, I'm just proud, like you can't imagine, proud of what you've accomplished. Oh, thank you so much. Thank uh, you for being a part of the part of the journey and uh, uh, a significant part of this journey. And it's sincerely appreciated. And uh, hopefully, we'll get together here in person sooner rather than later. It's been a crazy couple of years and a, a very pivotal year, obviously, last year in the history of uh, both our nations and the world. So, I'm hoping that we can get together in person here before too long. Yep. Let's make it happen. Awesome. Awesome. Jim, thank you so much for doing this. I sincerely appreciate it. My and, pleasure. uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. We'll talk out offline. We'll come up with, uh, we'll come up with our plan. Uh, any help is appreciated. Welcome to the gear highlight section of the danger clothes podcast. And since I was talking to my friend, Jim Shockey, I figured I would talk about something in this part of the episode that had to do with hunting. So I have a few of my bows out and I haven't been without a bow since I was five years old. That's when I got my, my first one. And, uh, I, there's one that I let go in one of the moves over the years that, uh, I think around 2000 or so, maybe 2000, 2001, uh, that thing took a walk at a garage sale. I'm still, uh, I'm still distraught about it. Cause I wish I had, I'd had that one since I was in, uh, junior high, I think. So, man, I wish I still had that one today, but um, I've kept the other ones. And my, when I graduated Buds, my present to myself was a bow. In particular, it was this bow right here. So this is a bear. And I went up to performance archery in San Diego and Bob Frome put this uh, bow together for me. So I've had this since 1997, um, since I graduated Buds. So very... Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to hold on to this one. And uh, at some point I'll put them all, all on the wall or something like that. Uh, especially when I go find the one that I had in like fifth, sixth grade, somewhere in there. Uh, I think it's at, uh, at a cabin. I think I know where it is. I'm going to track it down and, uh, and see what shape it's still in. So yeah, uh, can't go wrong with old uh, the legend himself, Fred Bear. So very cool. Very cool. So that's one. What else do I have here? So then uh, a few years ago, my friend John Hart, who started Sitka, he sent me this. It's uh, You can see the Sitka pattern there. And this is from a, a G5 Prime alloy, I think they called it back then. So I love this. This bow is awesome. Once again, went up to uh, Performance Archery and Bob Frome put this one together for me, which was very cool. I just said, Bob, put this thing together the way 
that you would if it was yours. So, um, yeah, so he did. Love that bow. Uh, this is my wife's right here. So this is a Matthews right here. This is uh, this is my wife's and great little bow right here. So archery has been a part of the family for quite some time. And then this is my daughter's bow. I think she's outgrown it though. So I think it's going to become my son's bow. And this is Hoyt Ruckus, I think they call this one. And this one's adjustable for, for kids. So back then when I got this, I don't know how many years ago it was now, there might be better ones out there, but you could really adjust this so that kid could, could grow with it over a few different seasons. So um, this thing was awesome though. Once again, Bob from at Performance Archery coming through for, uh, for my wife's bow for this. So awesome. If you're in the San Diego area, definitely go say hello. And then a couple of years back, John Dudley was kind enough to put this Hoyt together for me right here. So this is the uh, RX3 right there. And this thing, and this thing was awesome. Love this bow. Um, see the green right there. Knock on. Love it. And then my most recent bow is this one. It is right here. PSE NTN33. EVO NTN33. So this thing, wow. This thing is awesome. It was in the promo book trailer for Savage Sun. You might recognize it from the pages of Savage Sun, and you might uh, recognize it. Whoop! There we go. From the Terminal List, which is uh, coming up here, being filmed right now. So uh, you might recognize John Dudley and Nakon from the pages of Savage Sun as well. So. Point being, love archery. It's been a part of my life since I was five years old. At some point, I'll post a, a picture of me. I think I have a, a photo of me from back then. Uh, form might not be the greatest. Still might not be the greatest, but um, love getting out there with the bow and uh, love incorporating it into the uh, the plot of the novel. So, um, yeah, that is it. If you're thinking about taking the leap, uh, getting into archery, I highly recommend jump go, going to visit your local archery shop. Um, kind of like I encourage people to get books from their local independent bookstore. Same thing, local archery shops. I've always been, my favorite part of every summer was going to a local archery shop up where we had a, a cabin and we get to go there every summer, uh, upgrade the bows if they needed upgrading, get a few more arrows, get a couple bales of hay, that sort of thing. So I had great memories of that growing up. And I wish we had one here in Park City. I wish we had a local, uh, small independent archery shop here in Park City. That'd be fantastic. Maybe I'll start one. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend spend some time there, shoot a bunch of different bows. There's so many great ones out there these days. Uh, talk to the knowledgeable staff at these local independent uh, archery shops. There's so many great ones across the country, but uh, go spend time with them and then get your bows from them and get set up uh, with all the accessories and get the lessons and do all that through your local uh, archery shop. Uh, such a, such a great, uh, great institutions. And uh, I love spending time in local archery shops every time we travel. So anyway, that is the gear highlight section of this episode of Danger Close. Maybe I'll see you on an archery range soon. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. Once again, you can find Jim Shockey at jimshockey.com. You can follow along through there to all the social channels. He's Jim Shockey on Twitter and on Facebook and official Jim Shockey on Instagram. So be sure and check out all that he has going on and I'll be sure to keep you posted on Man of Sores, Soul Catcher. Man, this thing is awesome. So uh, if you liked what you heard, be sure and leave that review wherever you get your podcasts and I'll see you next time on Danger Close.